Hello, everyone, and welcome. You are listening to Dispatches, conversations about getting through the COVID crisis with community care, mutual aid, and personal and collective resilience. Today, we are sharing a conversation with Dean Spade about mutual aid. And I'm really excited about this because mutual aid has been something that has gained a lot of popular attention recently and is a pillar of this podcast. And I've been excited since we started the podcast to get Dean on the phone and have him help us shed some light on what mutual aid is, what it is not, common pitfalls that people fall into when attempting these projects and strategies for making it work. Dean is a prolific producer of incredibly insightful and pragmatic resources, and he is also very generous. He's created two fantastic websites, deanspade.net and bigdoorbrigade.com. Dean Spade has been active in movements to end poverty, criminalization, and immigration enforcement for over 23 years. In 2002, he founded the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, a nonprofit collective that provides free legal help to low-income people and people of color who are trans, intersex, and or gender nonconforming, and works to build trans resistance rooted in racial and economic justice. He is the author of Normal Life, Administrative Violence, Criminal Trans Politics, and the Limits of Law. And I'm your host, Becca Tilson. I'm an organizer, a movement baby, a somatics practitioner, and a mother living in Duwamish Territory, otherwise known as Seattle. We started this podcast in the tradition of our community organizing ancestors who taught us that we need each other and that we have each other, that even in these unprecedented times, we collectively do have what it takes to meet this moment with creativity love, and grit. So we're going to start today's show with a clip from a video Dean made that explains what mutual aid is. And I really encourage you to go to Dean's website and watch the entire video, which is extremely informative and beautifully done. Here's a short clip. Shit's totally fucked. What can we do? A lot of us are overwhelmed, pissed, and scared. I don't want to wait till the next election. I don't want to just write my congressperson and hope that they'll do the right thing. I don't want to just post things to the vacuum of social media. I don't want to just make statements about things. I want to change how things are. There are a zillion things we can do, and people are coming up with new ones all the time. Mutual aid projects are a form of political participation in which people take responsibility for caring for one another and changing political conditions, not just through symbolic acts or putting pressure on their representatives and government, but by actually building new social relations that are more survivable. The messages of this work are, the government is fucked, we can't rely on it. You are not alone. The system is the problem, not the person being targeted by it. And we're gonna take matters into our own hands and help each other survive right now, rather than expecting help from the same systems that have a clear history of causing harm. Mutual aid projects don't just help with the current disasters, they help us prepare for the ongoing disasters that are emerging because of climate chaos and crumbling infrastructure. When we build cooperative projects, practice making decisions together, share things, meet more people in our communities and learn about each other's skills and needs and learn how current systems work and how they are not working, we're better prepared for the next storm, the next blackout, and the next budget cuts. The messages of this work are, the government is fucked, we can't rely on it. You are not alone. The system is the problem, not the person being targeted by it. And we're gonna take matters into our own hands and help each other survive right now. When we build cooperative projects, practice making decisions together, share things, meet more people in our communities and learn about each other's skills and needs and learn how current systems work and how they are not working, we're better prepared for the next storm, the next blackout and the next budget cuts. Welcome, Dean. Thank you so much for being here. I'm glad to be here. How are you doing? How is your community? How's your family? It's a real mixed bag. I think I'm feeling simultaneously, you know, a lot of concern for people I'm connected to inside prisons and people I don't know inside prisons. And I'm feeling like moved and 
um, inspired by all the work people are doing to get people out and support people who are in prisons and support people who don't have homes. And, you know, it's a scary moment. It's like, are we going to have all the right wing fantasies come true, like closed borders and no transit and increased police presence profiling and locking everybody down? Or are we going to have like the left wing fantasies, like income support and decarceration and, you know, it's a period of extreme unknown. And so I think that lives in me with like lots of ups and downs. Absolutely. Speaking of people coming together and trying to figure out new ways, mutual aid has been blowing up the scene. Lots of people are talking about it. You know, you've been working within the model of mutual aid for many years and you just did this fabulous video that we just played. And I'm wondering um, if you could reflect to us about why you think it's blowing up and what are the opportunities and if any liabilities or things to be careful of about how popular it's getting so fast and how many people are suddenly knowing what it is. Yeah, that video that you just played um, is part of this project that I started um, around the time that Trump was elected called Big Door Brigade. What I was seeing was lots of people who are like really newly angry and scared and upset about this like horrifyingly scary president coming into power and the kinds of things that were emerging on the border and rollbacks on environmental protections and I mean just so many things, right? I saw that and what I saw was that people were really being demobilized often because what they were being told to do with that anger was just like click something on the internet, like, you know, go to the ACLU's site and promise that you'll defend the constitution, like totally meaningless, like, you know, kind of online actions, or maybe they're donating to some giant org and then waiting to vote, or maybe going to like once a year, like Women's March, because we live in a context in which there's so many like mass misunderstandings about how social change happens. And we're told it's like just when laws change, or it's just something elites do, or it's just what nonprofit professionals do, or it's just what charismatic individuals do. I saw those misunderstandings being impediments to people actually taking this passion and rage they're feeling and fear and getting to plug it in. And I wanted to lift up the framing of mutual aid, which obviously is like been a part of my whole life as an activist and help people think together about like, oh, the real thing to do when we're pissed and scared is to immediately build projects to support survival issues in our communities and do that from a perspective of like, hey, these systems don't work. They actually have to make things worse. We need something different. And there's all this stuff happening around it. It's being talked about in more mainstream news outlets, which is so great. Um, I think the promises of that are potentially that way more people get to have experiences of being in groups and actually engaging in collective action. Ideally, mutual aid groups are doing their work in a way that's got a critique of like charity and social services. So it's not like we're going to help the unfortunate and maybe kind of judge them and decide which are the the ones who are good enough to deserve help, but which is kind of what charity does, right? Because charity is funded by rich people and usually kind of kind of affirms the existing system while exceptionalizing a few poor people getting help. Mutual aid, on the other hand, is typically like people getting together and being like, this system is messed up. The people who are harmed by it aren't to blame. It's the system itself. Let's do the immediate work together to support people and be part of this broader collective action strategies in our region or in our state or nationally or globally to just try to stop the root causes, right? So Ideally, people do it right now are joining mutual aid projects in their you know, neighborhood to help people get groceries or pick up prescriptions or whatever the case may be, or they're giving to these funds to help certain kinds of workers who aren't you know, eligible for um, benefits or whatever it is, and they're learning more. So that's the promise of it. I think that there are a lot of pitfalls to mutual aid that are visible right now. One is that mutual aid projects can replicate charity and saviorism or social services dynamics. If we say, oh yeah, we'll help people, but not people who use drugs or not people who have felonies or you know, only people who have these kinds of charges from the state or or whatever, like those are typical kind of picking out who's the good and the bad or the deserving or undeserving in a particular group of people who need support or are suffering from some kind of vulnerability. Another dynamic is creating projects that don't have a root causes concern. So they are kind of like um, participating in the idea. And you see this represented in the news sometimes. I saw it, I remember like after Hurricane Hugo, people were rescuing each other in their boats. And there was this kind of like narrative in some of the sort of business media, like look at these entrepreneurs who have their own boat and are helping each other out. Like almost an implication, like we don't even need FEMA. We can just all volunteer to help each other. Kind of Reagan, Reagan, uh, you know, volunteerism story that we got in the eighties. Like let's devolve all kinds of state support and you can just get helped through like, your church or your family. 
that story is one that really collaborates with like um, abandoning poor people to the worst conditions. So we don't want a story about mutual aid that is like aligned with like the privatization of everything and the like end of, of all forms of like social safety net because that's super convenient to the like democratic and republican neoliberal agendas. And then people's own stuff can be like saviorism inside that, like can be like, I'm a hero because I volunteered this place once. Like, that's how we're supposed to think about supporting each other like once a year on Thanksgiving I go to the soup kitchen is kind of like the charity story of how we're supposed to engage with each other and that is deeply depoliticized and isn't about asking about root causes and it's kind of about like just stroking our own egos and being like it almost feels like the charity thing like I'm gonna get into heaven because I did this kind of you know um, all of that really misses the dynamics of how the harm that is experienced by the people on the bottom is what is making the people on the top so comfortable you know Um, and so one other thing I'll mention is I think there's a long-term danger of mutual aid projects being co-opted by the government or by corporations, by whoever's in power. We want to be careful that we don't build mutual aid projects that are like so complementary to the very systems we're trying to tear down, but instead that remain oppositional and that look out for that and that don't just become like an accessory to the harm that um, those uh, systems do. Wow. It seems like so many important tensions, especially as you were saying, mutual aid projects can be on ramps into movement. So you have people coming in with all sorts of perspectives and, you know, all of the ways, like you said, that we're just wired to fall back on the oppressive paradigms and they come through us without our knowledge. Charity, for example, and dominance white supremacy. And there's this tension between making a mutual aid effort really easy for people to jump onto and continuing to hold a very firm handle on an analysis. And I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, but I was sitting with that as you were talking. Yeah. I'll say that a lot of my experiences with that are from being part of organizations that are prison abolitionist in orientation. Let's say we're doing work to stop a new jail or prison from being built, or we're doing work to stop, you know, some expansion of criminalization in some way, you know, in the criminal law or something, or we're doing some kind of work that we think is abolitionist that's going to either keep people out of prison or stop prison from expanding or whatever. And we want to get a lot of people involved in this campaign, whatever it is. We don't want you to have to already be an abolitionist to join. (laughs) Like that's not going to work. Most people have never heard of evolution, right? Like we want people to be able to join because they're mad about this particular thing. And then we want to like embrace them, welcome them with their analysis, wherever it is and be together on this activity. And then also talk to each other about, why it matters that we're abolitionists. It might matter because we're going to be presented with an opportunity to make talking points about our issue and we can either make them about like how some people belong in prison and others don't or we can make them about how we should stop building prisons, right? Like all of that stuff, right? So it comes up in the strategy. So it can be, I think, useful for a group that's starting out and has people in it who are, have different political analysis to, to make sure there's a space where we can discuss our political analysis and try to influence each other um, while we also aren't like, if you don't already think exactly the way I do, you can't come in because that's just not going to work for building movements of hundreds and millions of people, which is what we need if we're going to win anything. I think the other thing about it is like, people are coming into a group and we're really trying to get more people in our group from lots of different parts of our communities. We don't want to be so rigid with any of our politics that we start there. So you come to the meeting and, you know, you've never had a conversation with about certain stuff about trans liberation or disability justice or whatever. And you like make a common mistake. We want to be like kind, loving, relationship oriented while we tell you why we're trying not to do that instead of like jumping down your throat and having to be the first engagement we have with you as policing you. And I think this is really hard for people because we want to be fierce and bold in our politics. And we also want to be spacious and forgiving and loving and, and build enough sense of shared support that if someone makes a mistake in the room, we're not also wounded by it, that we can't lovingly bring them to a place where they might be like, hey, yeah, maybe they don't want to say that anymore because it hurts people's feelings. Or how about compassion for myself when I was that person who was new to something? I think about all of that as a real manifestation of white supremacy inside of our work and the binary that's within white supremacy of good and bad. Like you are either with us or you're not. You're, you get it or you don't. And like then that rigidity. To me, male domination and white supremacy together feel like such a cornerstone of those patterns. Yeah, I agree. And, and one other thing I would say about white supremacy and that kind of like deep patriarchy is that they're really interested in how things look on the outside. And so it's like in this meeting, I need to look like I've got the right language and I need to be the first one to police you and tell you you don't more than I need to actually be like, hmm, how is this living in me? And is this going to be good for our group and good for bringing more people to the work of liberation? None of us are ever going to arrive at being perfect. 
you know, politically perfect, pure. But, but when I'm doing that thing where I'm like, I've got to correct the other person in the meeting, I'm like, I've got to get on the right side of this binary right away. And I've got to arrive and have everyone see that I'm the perfect anti-racist or the perfect, you know, whatever. That is about a culture steeped in punishment and a, and a false idea of like the good guys and the bad guys. Yeah. The question I had is about advice you would give people who are just starting. Either they are, they want to start their own group or they want to come into a group that they don't maybe even know anybody who's doing it. Everything's on emails and Google forms right now. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you asked this. I'm actually writing like a quick turnaround book for Verso Press right now about, um, about mutual aid and a lot of the book, a lot of what I'm trying to get in there is this kind of stuff about what's essential structure built inside a group that makes groups thrive and stick together. Because in reality, most of us have spent most of our lives in like really, really crappy meetings and in like groups where there was like somebody dominating it, like a dad or a principal or a boss, or we didn't get to make any decisions for ourselves where we were coerced into being in part of the group school or work or whatever. Um, and so most of us have to have no experience being in a group. It'd be like a nourishing, fun, energizing, satisfying experience. So we need to actually pay a lot of attention to that piece. And there's some elements of that that I think are really important. One is it's really important for groups to get clarity on how they're making decisions. A lot of times people just get together and they never have that conversation. And then it turns out like one kind of charismatic or dominant person or a certain clique are making all the decisions. Most groups I see fall apart, fall apart because they didn't have any clarity around who was going to make decisions. And then like you spent the money, you didn't ask the rest of us and we're mad at you. Or I um, broke our relationship to this coalition because I was un unhappy about something, but I didn't ask anybody else or whatever. People making decisions um, without each other's consent tends to produce a lot of conflict. In general, when people join mutual aid groups, they're going to do a bunch of work for free out of passion and they need to have a say in how that work goes because like, that's like a right on thing is if you're doing stuff to get to have a say in it. Most of us are used to jobs where we don't have a say in how it goes and that's awful and exploitative and also less efficient because it doesn't have the whole group's wisdom bringing together what would be the best way to do this. So figuring out a really clear decision-making method is really essential. Having conversations with people about what um, leadership looks like about trying to cultivate leadership that's about mutuality instead of domination. That's really hard again, because our culture hasn't shown us that. What's it like to have leadership that cultivates other people's participation rather than just trying to get my idea through and, you know, win. Similarly, having a conversation about group culture, um, organizations all have cultures, like just right away, there's a culture. Are we on time to meetings? Or are we late? Do we sing or not? Do we, you know, uh, do we, do we rush or do we take our time? I mean, all just endless cultural features. And so actually having an explicit conversation in the group, like, what do we want it to feel like? What was a group you were in that felt really good? What felt good about it? Uh, what's the group you were in that felt bad? Talking to each other about what would make it nice. <laughs> and especially being able to welcome new people. The left has a hard time often welcoming new people. If we've got more work than we can do, which most mutual aid groups do, how are we going to make it bigger? Um, or, or make more people trained up to do this so that they start another group and another group. Like, how are we going to do that? And so it might mean we're going to have special meetings where we orient people. We're going to make sure that when people come to meetings for the first time, they're not like confused by a bunch of jargon, but instead we give them the history. We're going to make sure someone checks in with them before or after. Like, hey, did you understand everything? Is there anything you need to know to start? You know, how do you want to plug in? Like, we need to make it really, really, really welcoming, like attractive instead of just like wishing people would show up and like hoping they do. <laughs> and I think other, other pieces that are essential Having facilitation, I think, again, like just kind of like making decisions, people often don't think about it. They're not like, oh, wow, facilitation, a skill most of us don't have, a skill we've never seen and acted well in any meeting we've ever been to in our lives. So there's tons of stuff online for free about how to facilitate meetings well, like just how to make sure everyone talked, how to use a go around instead of just having people volunteer. So you make sure you hear from people who you don't usually hear from. How to make sure that there's an agenda and that we start on time and end on time and that we actually know what, what's on the agenda and everybody had a chance to put their stuff on if they needed to and how much time roughly we're giving each piece. Facilitation is like a lifelong skill because it's ultimately about having people be able to come to a group and be in a group together and feel dignity and belonging and safety. And then to make sure roles like facilitation, note-taking, timekeeping um, are rotated. How do we make sure that there's not kind of like we don't further rigidify power dynamics that may exist by having like the same people do the same things every time. I think all of that's essential. I think people should be starting mutual aid projects. It's great to join them, but I've talked to several people like in our region who are like, yeah, I'm waiting for Tacoma Mutual Aid Group to collective to contact me back and you know, then I'll go help them. And I'm like, maybe they're overwhelmed. Some people think that a lot of groups like this should just be like 
20 people or less. And if they get bigger, we should just split off into more because then we can do more and we're in a more manageable group for making decisions. And then we can still coordinate with other groups in the area when we all want to stand up together and um, oppose the detention center. We all want to stand up together and push people to get released from um, Washington state prisons or whatever the case may be. The whole point of mutual aid is like, you can start now. It seems like a lot of what you're talking about revolves around new skills around becoming self-reflective as a group, sitting with difference and being inside of conflict. And I just love how you talk about conflict as like something that just comes up, that it's not this thing that is that marks only a bad group, but that it's something that is so human and that we just have to figure out our way around it. Yeah, one, one thing I'll say about that, I think a lot of us experience conflict as this incredibly heightened thing that happens after we've had to stuff our feelings for a really long time. We blow up or someone blows up about a, at us or when we find out that someone's been talking about us behind our back. Anytime you do things that you care about with others, conflicts will eventually happen. And that's totally okay and reasonable for so many reasons, but both because like difference, like differences of opinion are like legit. People have different wisdom and perspectives. And also because like we've all been trained in a society where we sometimes do really harmful things to each other. So conflict is going to happen for sure and should not be a reason not to do stuff. And the best thing to do is like think about how can we prevent conflict? So ways to prevent conflict include like giving direct feedback as soon as possible. So instead of me stewing on what you've been saying at these meetings for six weeks and then blowing up at you, could I earlier just be like, Oh, I don't know if you know, but when you say it this way, it really hurts me, hurts my feelings or makes me uncomfortable or whatever. And not talking about you behind your back. Yes. Like maybe it makes sense sometimes to have a confidential conversation about an impact. Like I'm going to talk to my therapist or my best friend about how it's impacting me. But I'm not going to talk to everybody else in the group behind your back about you and not tell you my concern. Certain things prevent conflict, like transparency in groups prevents conflict. Clarity about decision-making and planning so that we um, don't take on more than we can do. And then we're so stressed out. We're mad at whoever promised the thing, you know, like all of that, like so that I notice if I'm having dominance behaviors where I'm like trying to like decide for the whole group that we're going to do this and that and this and that, but it's really for my ego, you know, like all of that can really, really help us. And just trying to keep our eye on like competitiveness and other things that have been bred in us living in like white supremacy and capitalism and patriarchy. Ideally, if we work in mutual aid groups together really carefully using these kinds of tools, we actually become new kinds of people who could live in the society we're trying to build. Right now, we are the people who were created by the society we live in. And that's really hard and we're really hard on each other and ourselves, but that is utterly transformable. But we have to actually like as you know well, practice. What's it like to be flexible, but also have a lot of dignity and presenting what really matters to me and also be like, I really want to hear what matters to other people. What's it like to give direct feedback, even though I fear that the person will be blamed or they'll be mad at me? Or what's it like to receive direct feedback and be like open to the possibility that you have something to learn? Well, and there's this tangible thing that we can actually do together. It seems like that's one of the big benefits of the work, as you can see. I did this thing and now such and such person has groceries. Yeah. I mean, one thing I'll say this too, you know, I think we've talked about this before, Becca, but like a lot of people who are in our age group, you know, mid forties, a lot of people I know who were really radically involved when we were young, stopped being involved. And one of the main reasons people stopped being involved is because of conflict in groups. Um, and sometimes people say burnout, but I often think when I, when you dig deep with them, the burnout actually was that there was conflict and they felt really hurt and really not seen. So we need to pay a lot of attention to the dynamics in groups because we could either be right now in this moment where so many people are joining groups, we could either be giving people satisfying experiences of collective action and care, or we could be giving people new stories about how it's hopeless to try to do anything with anyone else. And people are awful and I just need to stay alone and be with my political beliefs without actually getting to like exercise them. And that would be such a loss. But I do think the more we share our skills with each other around creating good group dynamics, the more power this time will build. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have anybody that you're calling on that you're, that's speaking to you that you're thinking about or any way that your ancestors that you've claimed have, are preparing you for this moment? Yeah, that's a really great question. You know, recently I've actually been doing a bunch of different kinds of engagement around ancestry on my dad's side of the family. My dad's a Holocaust refugee. His family's from Germany. Um, they came here in 1938. I have been thinking about just their whole long ancestral lineage. So many times the world has ended for so many groups of people. It's just interesting to think about how people have held on to care, connection, tradition, um, spirituality, 
their values. It's interesting to, to see there are moments in history where people took those openings and made something that was more what they believed in instead of less. There's also like obviously immense tragedy. And for me, this moment feels like practice for every climate change disaster that is coming that's that are just going to keep coming. And so I guess I'm, I'm just like, wow, the illusion that I ever had that I knew what was going to happen next is obviously <laughs> complete bullshit, um, as it always has been for all people for all time. Uh, you know, and the question, it really is, how do I be of service in this intense time to the best of my ability with humility and care? And how do I kind of step into a big, bigger timeline? Like that's what the ancestor question does. And this is like, like, I feel like we're at the planetarium and we're backing out and seeing how huge the earth is and how little we are, how huge time is and how little my, my, you know, spark of life is for eight or nine decades, I hope. Um, and that lets me, it relaxes me because I'm like, yep, I'm part of this stream. I'm part of all the people who've ever tried to care for each other and, fight the power. And I'm also part of all the people who have just known so little. All we know is just like what well, the little, our little life experiences um, and whatever others can share with us now we're open to hearing. It's, it's relieving to let the mystery be where I am and also to, um, and to acknowledge that there is fear there and that the illusion of control that especially living in these systems asks us to have um, if we're in, you know, privileged, stable, living situations is really important to release um, in order to you know, see what the next right action is. I'm so glad I asked you that. That's, that was very grounding for me to hear. And I, yeah, I resonated with so much of it. It's like our, our ancestors were also very afraid. There was just something when you said that at the end about being afraid that, that called to me that was like, oh, right. Being afraid is not, does not mean that, that um, everything's going to going down. Yeah. And also like there's needs to be so much room for grief because people are literally dying in the thousands. And, um, and so it's like, also not to do that, that thing that capitalism has to do, which is like, look on the bright side, like, fuck that. No, let's look at how fucking horrible it is and support each other right now. And also find moments of care and joy and pleasure in all that relating. It's all we can do. Thank you everyone for tuning into Dispatches. So we have abundant show notes for this episode and you can find them at our website at dispatchespodcast.com. As I said, Dean's two sites are chocked full of goodies and Dean wanted to especially point out a few to you, including a chart that will help stimulate discussion about the differences between mutual aid groups and charity and social service groups, tools that might help people struggling with mental health and wellness during this time, a syllabus about mutual aid for a class that Dean taught, and lots and lots of COVID mutual aid resources. I want to dedicate today's episode to Lorena Borjas, who died of complications related to COVID. Lorena has been called the mother of the transgender Latinx community. I'll include some articles in the show notes, but you can also just Google her. I didn't know her, but from what I've read and heard from friends who did know her, she led an incredible life of action propelled by the values central to mutual aid. The New York Times wrote that when the trans community needed an HIV clinic, she made her apartment in Queens into a clinic. That's one of many stories about Lorena that you can find at our show notes or just on the web. Rest in power, Lorena Borjas, chosen ancestor of many. Dispatches is a kitchen dance party production. Producers are myself, Becca Tilson, Basil Shadid, and Molly Tilson. Today's episode was edited by the lovely Basil Shadid. Many thanks to all of our friends and supporters. Please rate and review us. Please tell your friends about us. And until next time, remember that we need each other and we have.